Hello, good morning and welcome to the first in a series of Logistics Manager Supply Chain webinars. I'm Chris Walton, your host for today and editor of Logistics Manager. Our webinar today is entitled How Brexit Will Affect Trade and Logistics and Trade. While coronavirus lockdown and its immediate impact has dominated daily life for the past three months, we cannot know when it will go away. But what we do know is if there is no trade deal between the UK and the EU by the end of the transition period this year, there will be serious burdens on exporters and importers alike. With supply chain resilience stretched to its limits, it is vital that the sector has time to respond to a Brexit deal. This webinar is designed to bring those in logistics and supply chain up to date with the very latest learning and understanding around Brexit. To that end, we have two speakers with a unique insight on the impact of Brexit on logistics and trade. Firstly, John Lucy is Managing Director of Tra International Transport and Trade Procedures at the Freight Transport Association. Many of you will know the FTA and the work it has done in the past four years, building a bridge between government and the freight transport sector over Brexit. John is an expert in his field and will guide you through the, uh, through the macro level impacts for logistics and beyond. And we also have insight from the front line of e-commerce. Nick Fox is head of logistics at fashion retailer Theory. Theory is part of Japan's fast retailing company and a sister brand to Uniqlo. Nick will be able to bring his insights to what logistics needs to do next in the face of Brexit negotiations. Most importantly, this webinar is interactive and we are keen to hear your questions and quandaries. So I'd urge you to ask questions throughout the presentations in the Q&A box you can find at the bottom of your screen. I'll be able to see your questions and I'll pose them to your experts, to your experts and our experts at the end of the presentations. Please keep these questions coming throughout the webinar and we will try and answer as many points as we can in the time available. So without further ado, the webinar will begin with John Lucy from the FTA. Over to you, John. Thanks very much, Chris. Morning, everyone. So a quick introduction to the FTA or the Freight Transport Association. It's now one of the UK's leading business groups and we represent the whole of the logistics sector. We have members from the road, rail, sea and air industries and also we represent buyers of freight services such as retailers and manufacturers whose businesses depend on the efficient movements of goods. In my presentation we'll be having a look at the potential impacts of supply, on supply chains when we reach the end of this year's transition period and hope to illustrate really why it's inevitable that supply chains will change and what the implications of these chains may well be for the UK exports of retailers and the logistics service providers themselves. So if we go to the next slide please. So this slide I think was, is quite a nice one really because it, more than anything it's, it's a simple uh, illustration of why the Brexit process has probably taken so many twists and turns this last few years. Um, you can see quite obviously now that many people thought that keeping the UK in some kind of customs union with the EU would mean frictionless trade. However, this is simply not the case. We can see that uh, Turkey is in a customs union with the EU, whereas Norway is in a single market. But imports and exports from both of these countries still have customs procedures and they still have friction at their respective borders. So although the Norway-Swedish border is possibly one of the smartest borders in the EU, it can still be 45 minutes to an hour for trucks to uh, transit through that border. And Turkey is obviously uh, can, ha can have some serious delays up to 24 hours sometimes for imports and exports into the EU from its uh, borders there. And what we do know now is that the UK is committed to leaving both the single market and the customs union on the 31st of December. So unless an extension is agreed by the end of this month, huge changes or seismic changes really to how we trade with the EU will, will commence on the 1st of January. So there's no getting away from this now. The, the, the direction of travel is, is set in stone now really. And although we still have some current uh, trade deal negotiations going on, this will not change the fact that we'll custom for formalities will be required on all goods. So whatever the results of the trade deal, that won't affect the fact that the customs formalities will apply to, uh, to uh, trading with the EU. And we'll illustrate the changes that and the effect this will have on the supply chains in the, in the next slide. So we go to the next slide, please. So some of the challenges we've uh, identified, we've been working on this very closely for the last two years with many government departments. And 
and with the industry. And we've really identified, narrowed this down to four significant challenges to the logistics sector. Basically because they all add cost, time and complications to cross-border movements come the 1st of January. So firstly, in terms of red tape, well, we need to understand what the new border requirements will be, what's required, when and where it needs to, and how to do it. We know that the existing rest of the world customs procedures will apply to European traffic. The question is really now, even in June, is how this is going to work in practice at the UK and the, also the European ports. Secondly, in terms of border delays, well, we know potentially they can be up to 10,000 trucks a day crossing the Dover Straits. So any delays, as we've seen in the past with various strikes or weather conditions, it has significant impacts on traffic flow on either side of the channel. And going back to pre-1993, the last time that we had customs formalities on European uh, freight movements, Dover alone had 220 customs agents for far less uh, truck traffic than those days. Whereas today, you know, we're potentially 10,000 10, a day, there are only 17 agents. So the same scenario applies to all of the railroad ports in the UK and, and within Europe, and also obviously in uh, Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland as well now. So it kind of gives you an illustration of the capacity shortages that is going to be actually to facilitate the, threat, the flow of freight across our borders. And thirdly, the skill shortage. Well, the driver shortage, HTV driver shortage, that's well, well documented. I mean, there's various figures uh, talked about between 40, 50,000 drivers short. This has been um, exacerbated recently, obviously, with Brexit scenarios. A lot of European drivers tend to of, of, uh, revert back to the countries where they came from. Uh, currency worries and concerns over Brexit have sort of accelerated this. So the, the driver shortage, if it, notwithstanding the issues with COVID, temporary issues with COVID now, is still there and still a real problem. And we've now got the additional problem of the uh, shortage in uh, customs intermediary staff, which again is estimated to be somewhere between 40, 50,000 shorts of staff actually required to process all this documentation when we switch over on the 31st of December to all European courts needing declarations. I mean, there's, I think there's something like a, many millions more declarations required per year, and there just isn't the customs capacity right, right now to, to handle this. And of course, COVID has thrown a span in the works because it's just tripped up everyone's uh, recruiting and uh, training needs for these new customs staff. From February, once agreed, we knew what the direction of travel with the government, that there was going to be no extension. The industry started gearing up to recruiting and training more customs staff, and of course, that fell by the wayside with the COVID crisis in March. And lastly, access to road haulage. There's still an issue of uh, or potential risk to the industry on both sides for a UK and for the European haulers that the permits may uh, resurrect themselves. Now, permits means uh, it's a restriction based on the number of vehicles on access to the market for our haulers and for European haulers to the UK market. Now, this is such an important uh, factor. This is right top of the agenda in, in, sort of in, the, in the final negotiations. In previous Brexit dates, in the last few weeks running up to the Brexit date, there was um, a backing down on both sides, shall we say, so they went to a six months unfettered access to the markets and they put the permits uh, question on, on hold. It's still there, it's still a real risk, whether it goes to uh, a very restrictive uh, style of permits or a bilateral style or no permits whatsoever, still remains to be seen, but there's still a risk for UK and for European holidays that uh, permits may well be an issue. So we've delved down into a little bit more detail on some of these issues now. So can we go to the next slide, please? Now, this is an old news slide, really, but you, and you, most of you will have probably come across this last year. This is the previous uh, slide for managing truck traffic in Kent and up to the all the uh, previous Brexit dates. It was called Operation Brock. And without going into detail now, because it's old news, but it's still relevant, and I'll explain why in a moment. There were four stages of stacking, if you like, of the vehicles going into the Euro tunnel and, and the port of Dover. The, once you got to the final fourth stage, uh, they reckoned they could, or estimated they could hold up to 11,600 trucks in the southeast on these arterial roads, which would be quite something to see. I mean, we've seen in 2015 35 miles of uh, vehicles on the M20, so we can, and this, this would have uh, eclipsed that uh, by, by far. The new concept now and the new plans for uh, uh, truck traffic and holding trucks in Kent 
uh, once we approach the end of the year is now what's known as a quick movable barrier system, which is basically movable concrete barriers. And this will create contraflows on motorways in Kent to deal with any significant traffic delays, and not just with Brexit going forward, but also again with, with weather and with, uh, with uh, uh, any, any strikes, potential strikes at Calais. So although it's another slide, new details on, on the, new, the new system, if you like, are, are, are very scarce at the moment from Highways England, but I'm sure this will come out near the time. So why will we get these delays in Kent? Why would you get thousands of vehicles stuck in Kent waiting to go out to Dover? Well, we'll see now on this next slide. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So this is the brand new facilities in the port of Calais, for example. This is probably one of the most advanced uh, facilities on the U European side of it. So what's the problem? Well, you can see on the left-hand picture that there are six bays there. That's for the agri-products needing the sanitary, phytosanitary checks. And opposite that is a four-bay uh, general customs warehouse of general inspections of normal freight of lots of uh, so not all vehicles, I'll emphasize now, it's, so it's not to be accused of being scaremongering, not all vehicles arriving in Cali will need to go through this facility. The drivers have to, and the, the, the operators and the exporters will be putting in um, export declarations before they leave the UK, which we'll go into shortly. And the drivers are on the ferry, they have a traffic light system on, on the screen in the driver's lounge with their vehicle details on it, and they're instructed then whether they have a green light, which means that they're either empty or they're moving under a transit uh, documentation, which means that they can leave the Port of Calais drive through as they do today, more or less. However, if you have a code orange or an orange lane, this means you have to go into this facility there for inspection, either of your customs documentation, the physical goods, if it's agri products, or there's a general risk inquiry run by the authorities and the French customs authorities, in which case you would go to the right, right hand booth. If you have agri products on, there's a fair chance that you'll probably have to go to both, in, both facilities opposite each other. And you also need an intermediary within the port to handle the details so the driver can't go around the port area, hand an in bit of piece of paper to these officers here. You have to have or your agents or your import agents from France or whatever has to actually have a, a legal representative in the port to handle that process for you. So that's another complication. So without scaremongering, even if you assume that 50 to 60, 70 percent of the vehicles arriving in Calais will need to go through the facility and the thousands of vehicles arriving in Calais every day, you can see, although this is good and it serves a purpose, and yes, it does work, I think in practical terms, in terms of capacity for transport, transferring uh, that many vehicles, it, delays are inevitable and that's why you have the delays backed up in Kent. It's not vehicles coming into the country that's going to be the problem in Kent, it's vehicles trying to leave. Go next slide please. So we're starting to see already really, and, and Covid is, uh, is, is exchanging this as well, it, it's played a hand in this really, it's changes the supply chain, so why would there be changes in, in supply routes and modes and different modes and all the rest of it. Well, basically, driver a company phrase, the traditional model is going to lose its time and cost advantage post-Brexit. Once customers are applied, if there are significant delays at Dover, that's one thing. But by and large, Brexit and the whole process in terms of customs and inspections on cargo, it suits more on a company to shipping. And we've seen this for the last few years now. This has been an upward trend and it's accelerating through this year, really, where trailers are shipped on their own without the driver. So obviously it uh, alleviates many of, the, many of the problems and the cost issues and the time issues with drivers and vehicles being stuck at, at, uh, on the Dover Straits, for example. Where will this occur? Well, more or less any of the ports away from Dover, the East Coast ports you would expect to be winners in terms of Brexit, it's right from the... Uh, Humberside down to the the Suffolk ports. And by and large, these ports tend to be also be container ports. So they already have customs facilities and inspection facilities on for handling containers from the rest of the world. So some of the infrastructure that will be required post-Brexit is already in place. So some of these, the, the ports I've mentioned that they're um, perfectly placed to take advantage of this. In terms of subcontractors, well, we know that 90% of the vehicles crossing the channel are foreign registered. So our, our, our international supply chains, as we've seen this last few months, are very fragile, especially when we've got 90% of the vehicles being relying on the subcontractor for their parties. 
and we expect many of these holies and we've spoken to a lot of these European holies since last year really when we started doing the Brexit trials with various government departments they were very much uh, apprehensive about any delays coming against the UK and also expect some worsening imbalance to the UK European trade flows which we know it's, it's traditionally be bad anyway we import far more than the exports which affects our export prices and if there's any changes in that which we may but well have in terms of the recession on the back of COVID as well we've become uh, less of an attractive destination really for the for the general uh, European trucking markets shall we like and also we've got the currency issues and again potentially there may be permits market access issues to uh, contend with which will put off a lot of the large uh, European holders and in terms of what we don't know really is any trade lane changes so as the new uh, trade agreements are agreed with countries outside the eu we will in, in time we'll start seeing some uh, possibly different trade routes for example if trade is, is increasing massively with the usa we can expect the ports of liverpool to pick up a huge amount of container business as as trade in different products moves to different countries around the world so if we go to the next slide please And this is a very, very high level issue really, but this, we've found in our work doing this with, with industry and with the buyers of logistics services, especially in the SME sector, there's, there's still um, a significant uh, lack of knowledge in what's required post Brexit. There's an assumption that the whole industry will take over customs declarations and all the rest of it, and we find it's not that simple really. So this is a very basic checklist for shippers or traders to consider post Brexit in terms of custom procedures you need to consider your tariff codes, country of origin, licenses may be required, what your INCO terms are, your trading under and so on and so on. There's a whole world of information and knowledge to be learned by, by many, many shippers and uh, experienced and established shippers who are dealing with the rest of the world. They'll be familiar with all of this, but the, according to HMRC's, HMRC's estimates, there's something like 240,000 traders who only trade with the EU who are new to all of these uh, concepts and processes. So from now to the end of the year, realistically, there is a massive knowledge gap in terms of how this is going to be uh, rolled out, not just with, with the logistics service providers, but also for the uh, their customers, if you like, the, the shippers of the goods themselves. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, Added to the customs, there's additional problems now for uh, various uh, products, and particularly food and uh, agri products, which by and large are uh, at the centre of uh, this, the trade agreements. So, in terms of the negotiations that we can see now, what we can expect? Well, the EU's opening position really is basically a hardline, systematic sanitary and phytosanitary checks at the border, in border control points or BCPs, as they're called. So this would be 100% of products arriving in any EU port that would have to have a physical check. Whereas the UK is open in position on negotiations is basically to create a separate uh, SBS regime, which wouldn't be aligned to EU standards. And it would seek equivalent measures that if agreed could offer preferential conditions to uh, EU goods. The guidance, the guidance uh, strategy if you like for the, for the UK negotiations is symmetry so whatever is in place on the European side will be imposed on the UK side and uh, vice, vice versa so there won't be necessarily an easier uh, way in for European goods coming to the UK which will hamper your UK exports to the EU so the possible outcomes if we just go to the next slide please so from these negotiations, what can we expect? Well, as we said, this uh, is a scale of um, what we can expect in terms of IQ products and, and the checks. So bear in mind, this is addition to any customs requirements. This is over and above. So in the worst case, 100% documentation and identity checks, physical checks on up to 50% of consignments arriving for certain types of products. So if you can imagine that, 50% physical checks on all, all agri products arriving into the EU. At the other end of the scale, we could make, potentially have a New Zealand style agreement, which requires only one or two percent physical checks of the cargo and a more digitalized process for health certificates and lower inspection fees. Because don't forget, all of these inspections come at a cost. So you need there'll need to be an intermediary in, in, the, in between the importer and, and the haulier or the, or the freight agent. But regardless of 
what end of the scale the uh, negotiations uh, ends up at the end of the year for sure as with customs there's going to be some kind of document identity and physical checks on the arrivals in the eu some checks may be able to be done at the place of destination or departure and because of the symmetry uh, strategy or, or philosophy you like you can expect similar arrangements on uk imports so it will be in balance whatever the rules are it will be in, in balance between the uk and, and europe uh, because the next slide, please. And one potential the issue that this is thrown up that as we leave the uh, the EU is if you if you export to the rest of the world outside the EU, you'll probably be familiar with this. That your your wooden pallets that contain your goods need to be heat treated, basically to prevent in, in, insect infestations moving around the world. So it's very keen and or very strict in places like Australia and uh, America. And from the South America, it can be quite a, quite an issue, and obviously from the African countries. So, because we leave the uh, the zone, if you like, we're deemed that our, our insects may be uh, dangerous and subject to infesting infesting uh, Europe overnight on the thirty first of December. Now, the UK's position on this at the moment is that they will not enforce it. Defra said they will they won't enforce it, and they will not be inspecting uh, the physical pallets that the goods are loaded on into into this country. The EU or the Europe. Uh, has been a bit more woolly on this. They haven't said they will and they haven't said they won't. So for the moment, we can assume that if you're exporting foodstuffs or agri products, which are more likely to, and will be likely to, to uh, have physical checks at the borders, um, one can assume that you would need to be using these heat treated pallets, which need to be certified, declared on the export documentation, and they need to be stamped accordingly. And of course, because of the, there's no requirements for the moment, there's a, there's a huge shortage of uh, heat treated pallets for the market. So there's a, at the moment, there's, for previous Brexit days, there's been a supply and demand issue within the, within the pallet sector. Although one can imagine that this has been improving as the course of this year moves on. But obviously, you know, it, this, again, this is a small but significant uh, switch of where problems can go wrong for next year. And uh, next slide, please. So for Northern Ireland, obviously this is work in progress, as much of this is, even at this late stage in, in, in the proceedings. And for Northern Ireland, this is something in terms of customs, it's unlike anything we've seen before. There's going to be a legal, but an invisible customs border between the North and South of Ireland. But in practice, this is obviously going to be a, a, a customs border, if it can be called that, in between the GB and the Ireland of Ireland. So goods deemed entering or guilt entering in Northern Ireland, which are uh, are deemed at risk of entering the European Union by the border into the south, they're de deemed as at risk and they are subject to duties payable. And obviously this is uh, still unfolding as this year rolls on. And at the moment, the, the, the UK's government position has been that there will be no new infrastructure in place on the Northern Irish side. However, there will be physical checks required on Say, for example, the Scottish ports or the, or the northwestern UK ports to go into uh, for the railroad ports for goods going into, into Northern Ireland. So, I've got through a very high level area of risks, I suppose, and um, it, there's a huge amount of detail to go into each of these areas, respectively. But it, in, in the time available, I think that's a, that's a reasonable high level view of the risk that we see affecting the logistics sector. So, to summarize, really, uh, as far as the trade is concerned and the industry is concerned, from the 1st of January, customs formalities will be required. Safety and security declarations will be required. UK imports, exports, including those in Northern Ireland, will require sanitary and phytosanitary health certificates as appropriate. And these goods will have to travel via the border control post. And movements between the GB and Northern Ireland may well require import entries, and they may well be dutiable if they are going to the Republic of Ireland. So, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much indeed uh, for your time there and for your presentation. Uh, we've been getting lots of questions coming through. Um, and one question I would like to address particularly that a lot of you have been asking is, can we get copies of the slides? So just on, on that point, uh, a, record, a copy of a recording, a recording of this webinar will be hosted on logisticsmanager.com and that will be available from this afternoon uh, so you'll be able to see the slides that way uh, in terms of some of the questions that we've had through directly for john um, 
I'll just go through these very quick because there are quite a few. Um, but one question that did crop up was, is logistics as a, as a group using technology to reduce or remove uh, the requirements for skilled people to make declarations? And that comes from Colin Malpass. So the question is, will technology replace human beings to do the declarations? Yes. Um, well, yes and no. I suppose eventually the way things are moving from a technology point of view, I think is possible. There's certainly nothing in place for the 1st of January and there hasn't been on any of the previous um, um, uh, Brexit dates. You have to bear in mind that it's not just the logistics sector that has to uh, comply and, and come up with these solutions. You're interacting with customs authorities for different countries and VAT regimes in different countries. And as we know, government um, technology tends to lag behind private technology quite uh, considerably sometimes. So to have a, uh, I, if we understand the question correctly, they're talking about a drive-through border. Now this is a concept that's been worked on and it's, it's it's beyond five years timeline. That's all I can say at the moment. Something it, it won't be within the next in in the recent uh, short short term of Brexit. There's just nothing in place because you have so many stakeholders to, to connect on the same system, and that's basically your problem. It's not just it's not just the haulage industry needs to sort itself out with with a, a new uh, a new IT uh, platform or something like that. You have to link up customs authorities around Europe and so on and so on. So. That will be a long time coming, is a short answer. <laughs> um, this question comes from Mark Edwards um, and it says, is there an indication at this stage of expected percentages that will be selected for examination at cross-border? Uh, for general freight, no. The, on the UK side, I think the, uh, the for, uh, I might be uh, wrong here, but I think for container freight at the moment going rest of the world, I think the uh, the inspection rate is 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 ten percent or even less of UK exports in containers pulled for inspection before they ship, if you if you like. And I would imagine it will be the same. There, there won't be any increase in the risk assessments, if you like, for uh, European exports. I think I think that uh, the numbers wise will remain the same. Of course, it's a different situation. I mean, you, there's two types of checks. You've got the, the risk the risk checks, which is what Border Force carry out, and the checks we've been talking about here, really, the phytosanitary checks, which is where you have um, meat or animal or vegetable products that require health certificates and uh, proof of origin. So you can imagine fish from Scotland going to Paris or something like that. It, it, they need proof that it's British fish, not imported from Canada or so on and so on sort of thing. So, it gets very involved. So you, there's two types of checks. There's a, there's a, there's a risk analysis check, which probably in terms of uh, percentages will not increase, but then you have your SBS checks and the level of that as described will depend on the outcome of the trade deal negotiations. We're on that scale between the EU hardline at the moment and the potential New Zealand style agreements in the future. So uh, John, John, I'll just ask one final question uh, just before we move on to Nick Fox and his presentation. Um, if you could just summarise, what do you think uh, for, for 3PLs and, and, and road freight hauliers in particular, what would be a best case and a worst case scenario that we're facing in January? Well, I suppose the best case scenario is that there's an extension agreed and there's another six months to prepare but we'd actually know what the infrastructure will be in place i think i think the problem now with the industry accepts that there's going to be customs people who you have long memories like myself remember what it used to be like um you know pre-93 with customs on european freight. the, the danger is really the market's access which has always been a problem if we, if we have severe restrictions because there's no bilateral permit system available now for uk trucks to go to any european country are some of the uh, smaller ones on the outskirts of uh, Europe. So that's a whole new system that needs to be uh, established. The default position is the ECMT permit system, which we know can only provide 5% of the uh, permits for the requirements, both for us and for also the Eastern European holders. It comes to tend to dominate the UK market. So there's an issue there, really. So the best case scenario is, is there's no change on the 1st of January until maybe the 30th of June or the 1st of July. There's some kind of extension agreed. Um, that would be the best case. The worst case scenario is that we're going to go hardline 
and the information really the big problem is now is not so much to doing it it's the information exactly who needs to do what when it needs to be done and how it's going to be done at the border itself and that needs to be out right now the, 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 what you will call a border operating model is 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 uh, is needed now so that companies have six months to prepare and say okay this is what the problem with all previous Brexit really is we haven't really known what is going to be required right up to the last minute now we know there's 100 percent going to be customs going to be customs controls customs formalities we just need to know how it's going to be done fantastic John, uh, you'll be glad to know the questions continue to flood in and we will tackle those uh, towards the end of the webinar. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I would like to now move on to Nick Fox. He's, as it says on the screen, Head of Logistics at Theory, who will give us a much more micro level of the Brexit process. So Nick, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, theory is, as uh, Chris mentioned before, it is actually part of Uniglo and within Uniglo there's a section that deals with, uh, can I call them more upmarket brands that you'd expect to find in Selfridges, Harrods, Bloomingdale's and the like. Um, it's actually a US company owned by uh, Uniglo and the size of the supply chain, albeit the volumes are not the sort of Uniglo volumes or, or Primark volumes or something like that, but the the supply chains range from origins of China, Vietnam, Peru, Mexico, even California, where we manufacture for some of the brands within the uh, luxury division. Uh, they come either to the US or to the UK, the stock, and the UK is the logistics hub for most of Europe and uh, Russia and most of Russia. So we need to take a um, very proactive view Brexit and the opportunity I think today is that we can talk about how we're doing it at a, a line by line level but to do it um, I'd like to just go through um, the initial thinking uh, on this. I've attended a lot of Brexit in, uh, interviews, a lot of Brexit seminars over, over the last year or so and one of the things that you're always told is that you have to make a plan but nobody ever tells you what the plan is. And in addition to taking a plan, I think it's very important that you take a view as well. Um, we've heard a lot of good stuff from John about the ambiguities of where we are at the moment, but ultimately with a relatively short time scale, it is time uh, to take a view. And my view and the way, if I could share it, the way that uh, we're sharing it, uh, the way we're working it within the theory uh, group of companies is that there will be a no deal Brexit. The, uh, there's a big insistence from the EU at the moment on adhering to environment, labour laws, financial regulation. But the idea of Brexit is that we don't have to follow these rules. Not saying I agree or disagree, but that is where we stand at the moment. So with all the ambiguities that John has raised, we've looked at these as well. I've taken a view or the, the, the company's taken a view that with so much at stake here, it's very difficult to see uh, what else we're going to be able to do. So if we could move on to the next slides, please. The UK, we've taken the view the UK has left the EU. And we have to go through almost like breaking up with a partner that uh, we've left. It's over. It's not you. It's me. All the rubbish lines that could possibly come out. That is where we stand. We have to take this level of acceptance. And there's not really any other way of managing it. So what do we do? If we look at the next slide, please. Although, and these figures have been touted about for quite a while, although the Union, European Union is 50% of our trade, it's also, there is also 50% of our trade with other parts of the world. And whilst we need to put in infrastructure and ways of managing this, which uh, I'm going to come to, um, our largest trading partner is in fact the United States. The United States is not always the easiest country in the world to deal with. It's obviously a lot more difficult trading with the United States than it is trading with the countries of the EU. There's an awful lot of compliance, awful lot of regulation. Anyone who's 
uh, sent goods through um, uh, ports in California know how difficult it is sometimes to to get your stock through with inspections and uh, and what have you. But they're still our largest trading partner. So where does that leave us now? What could we possibly do? So if we move on to the next slide, and it really is we is the European Union going to have the same trading issues as the United States? Um, the European Union does have issues, but with COVID, rules on state aid have been suspended. Lufthansa has taken a huge bailout from the German government. Uh, Italy's economy, when we get back to trading, will be in a very serious situation. Um, and Nissan, interestingly, have a plant in Barcelona, which as it stands, they look like closing, and they look like maintaining the Sunderland plant. So whilst we have to prepare for the worst, uh, we can also hope for the best. We can also see that the European Union have moved. So how do we get ourselves into a state, into a situation whereby we are prepared to face these things? And that's really by laying out, and how John has laid out so well, the situation we find ourselves in. And hopefully here, I'm hopefully uh, expounding the way we've looked at this. What do we do? How do we prepare for it? Well, if we could move to the next slide. All of these rules that uh, John's mentioned and are coming up now, WTO, you can see on that word cloud there, so many things, so many acronyms, associations, and, and everything else. But what, in preparing this uh, talk, I found it quite cathartic in a way, is because it brings out exactly what is the underlying way to deal with this. And I've always felt that to do so, it's about managing your data as a business. And this is, this is the way we're going through it. We're, we're, we're a long way from being where we want to be. But if we're talking a direction, every, like I said before, everyone says you have to have a plan, you've got to, you've got to do something. Thing. Well, what do you do? And our view is that it's all about data. We, we all know that there's the big data world, that we all know that there's uh, data talked about from any of the, anyone from Google, Facebook, and all of these other people. Well, really, they're all examples in very different ways, and Amazon as well, of course. But they're all examples of businesses. Whilst they've got a fantastic business model, never mind their ethics sometimes, whilst they have a fantastic business model, they have done it by managing their data. Um, and they also do it by getting other people to do the work for them. Um, and I'll come to what I mean in a minute in more detail. But if you take most people nowadays do online banking, I would suggest you pay your bills through it, you transfer money through it. I don't know if anybody listening has actually written a check in the last year. All of those things have disappeared, and that's because of the huge investment and the management, big and small, into looking at the individual processes. So where we've looked at the macro level of issues involved in Brexit, my uh, line on it here is that individual businesses need to look at a micro level and need to look at their data. Now, whilst uh, it's true that government um, systems are going to be behind private sector systems there is still a lot of opportunity and a lot of we can do we have the uh, theory we have the issue that if we're importing from the places i described before china usa um, these are all places whereby we are paying duty on import now if we export to the european union and there's duties there as well we will be paying duty on export in theory that would mean that we are double paying duties. And some parts of our business, because of our supply chain, do in fact have that issue at the moment. So again, what are the ways that we can, uh, we can do it? And again, it comes back to the same thing. In looking at this issue, it's very much about data. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. If you don't remember anything else from my section um, of this webinar, there's three things to remember, three very important things. So if we could do the first click on this, please. 
when if you are have if you have a product if you're manufacturing a product if you have a product somewhere in your supply chain there is always a lot of data associated with that product and you need to and you need to harvest that data you need to grab that data at source now with um fashion industry it's particularly as all industries are it has its complications the fashion industry has a huge level of skus not products, but SKUs. One pair of jeans, if you look at the color, size, and fit, has 36 SKUs. The same product can have, in fact, different HS codes because of different ways of treating the textiles when they're manufactured. All of this data is created in the factory where it's made. And I will be pertinent, if that's okay, to the fashion industry here. But when uh, you send an order, you send a purchase order to a factory in a, in a third country and you say, I want a thousand of these items. Well, with the thousand of those items, once they manufacture it, they will be creating data. So into the system, they will need to say, I have manufactured a thousand units or it might be I've only manufactured 900 units. You still need to know that. These units are in this color size fit breakdown these units have this hs code because you've told me it's got this this hs code but that is all data and remember as well another thing is that there's a big difference between data and information at this stage to me that is data that's a lot of numbers and figures and words that should be on a system now to put that into a format that's when it becomes information if we could move to the second slide please. second clip when you've got this data, you need to be able to use it and to, to use data through your supply chain. It has to be in a commonly accessible system. Now, this is one thing that I've been working a lot on in my current business. And I worked before uh, as a managing director of a 3PL, whereby we were helping a lot of SME businesses. And the issues with these SME businesses, all fashion businesses, they made great products were always the same and in their supply chain it all came down to the same most of their information was in fact data and it belonged on a spreadsheet it was on a word document it was on a pdf and what happened someone was on holiday someone was sick how many times in your business do you have it that somebody's off sick and they have to send you a whole load of spreadsheets or they in a lot of instances with these companies people have to take their pcs on holiday with which was very, very, or still is, I'm sure, very, very common with people having to do that because there's nobody else to do it. And one of the reasons for this is that there is no commonly accessible information. So you enter the data at source. You get, if you can, you get the factory to enter the data at source onto your system. The other issue here is the amount of companies with reasonable pretty good supply chain systems there's a lot on the market and they're not expensive and you can have web-based ones whereby you pay a, a monthly subscription or something like that the amount of sme businesses i deal with and used to deal with in the fashion industry that did not use their system correctly so there was no data enter at source no everything was on a spreadsheet they had no way of managing this so what's this got to do with brexit well, once you have all your information like that, and if we could move to the third click, please. It is the computer that should be telling us what to do. So you put all of your information, all of your data into your system, and then it's the computer that does, for example, the stock allocation. It says how much it's going to send to what particular customer, stuff like that. You need to know information about a shipment. Well, if you have that shipment information in the system, the computer will generate your packing list. The computer will generate your invoices uh, for clearance, wherever that might be. And you will need, as John has pointed out, you will need packing lists and invoices probably coming into the UK or being dispatched from the UK to Europe. There are many, many more opportunities to do this um, that might be imagined as well. So you have your own system. Also, the market has developed such that a freight forwarder now, freight forwarders are not only freight forwarders, good ones anyway. A freight forwarder, the top freight forwarding companies in the world are IT companies. 
I deal with, with quite a lot of forwarding businesses and my number one criteria on a freight company is not who can get me three cents a kilo less from Shanghai. My number one criteria on a freight company is what is their IT capability? How much data can they harvest for me? How much can they absorb? And how, much, how can they run this side of the business for me? And that is, those opportunities are there. You need, this is not only inbound to the UK, outbound, we use a myriad of uh, um, courier companies who also do the same. If you've got your data in a system, you can also tell the system, you can tell DHL that this is what I'm exporting and DHL will do your export declaration for you, or at least that is what they are gearing themselves up to do. So speak to all your providers, see how much they can do about this and see what they can do for Brexit for you. But remember, go to the next level. Don't say to them, um, what can you do? Get to the nub of it. How are you going to do it? What data do you need from me that I can give to you that will control all of my uh, processes in importing and export? So we can have the last clip, please. To manage Brexit, to manage the issues that John has raised and to manage the issues that uh, I've put further, further up the thing, not only do you need to take a view, not only do you need to uh, look to manage the worst possible situation, but in managing it, it comes from the root of your business. It comes from your factories, it comes from your suppliers. If you get your data together in one place, then you've got a far better chance of being able to manage Brexit. Thanks very much, Chris. Nick, thank you very much indeed for your presentation and for your time uh, this morning. We've got a few more minutes to answer questions. So uh, if, and questions have been coming in as you've gone through your talk. So if you can click on the Q&A box, we've now got maybe 10 minutes at most to, uh, to go through some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, so a lot of you agreeing, Nick, on, agreeing with you, Nick, on the point about data. Um, and one, one question that's come up is, is how clear do you think we are as, as an industry on what data businesses need to have to, to thrive after Brexit? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. And I think there's a bit of a divide coming up um, because it's, it's like in a lot of businesses, the most successful online businesses are businesses that have invested in managing their data. You know, Amazon's been the obvious one. Um, and there's a divide between them and businesses uh, to be a very a bit unkind and a bit crude you've seen the amount of retailers that have failed in in recent uh, weeks and months and ones that are pretty much on the edge but to a large extent they failed not because their products were bad i mean a struggling retailer for example is debenhams there's nothing wrong with the products they sell it's more how they've managed their data they've never really had a, a go-to website um, and they failed in that is, is the harsh truth about it. So I, I would say in, in from what I've said is when you're looking at a provider, look at their IT capabilities more than you look at their freight capabilities. Hmm. Another question I've had through, um, and I'm not sure we can name names here, but, but lots of people are asking about which, which providers to work with. So I wouldn't, wouldn't want to ask you directly that, but, but how Nick have you worked um, with some of your existing providers and kind of gone out to market to look at, at, at new providers who can help you with, with your data needs to manage through this Brexit process? Um, well, certainly, uh, if I could give you a plug, Chris, certainly formats that uh, the logistics manager have organised, uh, conferences, exhibitions, trade oh, fairs. God bless you. <laughs> But no, I found, um, and uh, I am available on LinkedIn if anybody does want to uh, ask further. But um, certainly there's a lot of very innovative um, providers who, who can massively help. Uh, you know, I've got some that do come to mind, which I'll speak to anybody openly on a one-to-one -one basis, but their IT is just, it's just fantastic. I'm really pleased with some. Uh, we're getting just just widening it out and spring John back into conversation as well. Uh, we're getting quite a lot of questions uh, specifically about uh, the border between Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland. Um, so I will just just kind of pick some of those at random if that's all right by you, John. I know it's not. I'll have a go. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not your key area. Um, so uh, do you, one question that's come up is would um, freight 
uh, road hauliers uh, based in Ireland uh, transiting through to the UK have to endure some del additional delays uh, once they enter a port either in Wales uh, or Scotland or England? Well, it depends on the goods that they're carrying. If it's agri products coming from Ireland, uh, the Republic of Ireland into the UK or into the mainland UK, either by a northern port in Ireland or, or, or Dublin, it would be the same difference. So it's still an EU export into the UK. So obviously, it, 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 I understand the question. It's a huge area this because obviously, how do you stop European goods? drifting into the into the UK by the back door and vice versa and the, obviously the government is all over this and they're trying to come up with solutions how this is going to work in practice so it will depend on the type of goods basically it, because all all food agri products will require uh, uh, some level of inspection as I said which it depends on the level of inspection will depend on the, the results of the trade agreements so it could be a little or up to 50 percent of checks or goods requiring checks. Um, and I'll, I'll ask this question to the both of you, but we've talked a lot about data, a lot about the data required with customs clearance. Uh, one question that's come up is how many, how much of these processes can be automated um, and, and how much is the sector looking at automation within, within, this, within these challenges? Uh, if Chris, if I, I can butt in there, the, um, one of the most important ways of doing it, certainly for um, the, the supply chain we have, whereby we're importing globally, exporting to Europe, is the customs freight simplified procedures. Basically, having a supplier who has a customs warehouse, you will be able to import and hold the stock without paying duty. Uh, and you will only pay duty at the European border when you release it, assuming that duty is payable uh, in Europe. If you export to Europe, if you export to France or Germany, um, you would only pay duty going into the European market. So if you check out CFSP, it's probably the most effective process for handling it. Uh, and there's a lot of automation with that if you have your systems linked to the custom systems, uh, which obviously we have, uh, which is very wide and very common. And a good 3PL provider will be able to do all that for you. Yeah. What I would say, Above all last, yes, the all good freight forwarders will be able to do your customs separations for you, provided you can find a, customer, a freight forwarder who will actually want to take on your business. Uh, a lot of forwarders will only take on customers' business now if they're getting the freight as well, because they're going to be inundated with work at the end of the year. But if you think of the scale of the problem, you've, if you can imagine every exporter and every importer around the EU and the various customs authorities within the 27, 28 countries where it's going to be, all have to be able to talk to each other on one platform and agree to do this. This is a monument to, to, to do a joined up big IT system so you can have a driverless drive through your border where everything is online so there's no physical uh, stopping. It, it, it's a big ask and it's going to take a lot of time to organise and a lot of commitment from the government really because it's not just industry, you, you, need, you need to get government departments on board and the sharing of information between different customs authorities and so on and so on and so on. So it's a, it, it's, it's a big problem which or a big challenge depending on how we uh, look at it. Uh, one question that's, that's coming up quite often uh, is the notion of someone being AEO certified. I don't know if anybody can understands what AEO means and, and can explain it to, to those watching. Uh, authorised economic operator and I think I'm right in saying that the EU have not, if you're a UK AEO, I'm not sure it's been 100% ratified by the, the Europeans that they will recognise it as a, as a mutual uh, uh, a qualification for the, for that company. Basically, it's it's it goes back to the old sort of trust the trader scheme, really. Although no, nobody likes to call it that anymore, sort of thing. So you you if you're an AEO operator, you are allowed various customs easements, and it, and it does help in terms of Brexit. But it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't make things wonderful on the first of January, and it's not necessarily suitable for a huge amount of companies. It's so you need to really look into it if it's suitable. To be fair, though, most freight forwarders are AEO operators anyway because of the, that's their market, that's their specialism. For an, a trader, it, not necessarily is a, would you need to be one. So it's more 
you know, for your service provider. So all the big freight forwarders are all, tend to be AEO authorised anyway, and authorised in different countries other than the UK. So what probably the ones that Nick's uh, thinking of, all the big names who have depots throughout the world and throughout Europe will have a, a, a global AEO status. So. And just as we've got five minutes left, I'll, um, I'll kind of ask a, a wider question to both of you is that, that what, what are kind of your, your hopes and fears for the next six months of negotiations and, and, and what, what would you like to see happen between now and that transition period ending? If you can both answer that very short, in a very short way, that'd be really helpful as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should I go first? Uh, uh, go on, John. Uh, information. We need, we need information. <clears throat> we need to know exactly what we need to do. It's not just the transport sector, it's the customers of, it's the freight forwarders. Everybody needs to know what they need to know, and they need to know it now, really, because time is ticking away now. COVID has thrown a complete span on the works in terms of preparation from the industry side of things. And it's going to be a much weaker industry coming out the other side of COVID in terms of uh, its capabilities and capacity in terms of preparation for the end of the year. So we need a definitive road plan of what's going to happen and how it's going to work at all the various ports. And a big fear, which is thrown up with previous Brexit bases, we, we could possibly end up with different procedures and processes at different ports and for different types of different modes of transport so if a trader was unaccompanied it's going to be different to a driver company one and how on earth are we going to get that rolled out through 27 countries in six months time it's just a massive education process and knowledge uh, uh, learning curve that we need to go through now really yeah uh, to me it's uh, going to be a case of the the the, the quick and the dead really I think I think uh, we've got no option but to improve one of the things brexit will do or should do is force everybody to improve their uh, their their use as I've said use of data the quality of the providers that they're using and the quality of their supply chain the uh, brexit is about supply chain it's the fundamental thing that it's about and you have to invest in that and as I say it's a bit of a bugbear of mine. Uh, working with many fashion businesses, you can imagine that somebody's priority is not going to be this because they're a, a fashion icon and I've worked with quite a lot of fashion icons and you can't blame them, they produce fantastic products. But Brexit is about supply chain and it's about data and uh, we're going down that route and I would encourage everybody else to do the same. Excellent. Well, I'm afraid uh, that our time on this webinar is coming to an end now. Um, so I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to thank our experts for their uh, expertise and time uh, and also to everybody who pitched in with questions as well. That's fantastic. It really makes the whole thing uh, go much easier. Uh, so just a few things that we have coming up uh, in two weeks today on the 23rd of June, we'll have our second logistics manager supply chain webinar uh, where we're looking at overcoming fulfillment and distribution challenges uh, in COVID-19. Um, I've already spoken to our, our two speakers there and this is it's absolutely enthralling in terms of what's what's happening so we have uh, Jim Gallagher who is supply chain procurement and logistics director at German home appliances manufacturing giant BSH, BSH and Tom Rose uh, who's the head of international operation at Spar International uh, so look out for an email in your inbox soon in order to register um, also, as you can see on your screen, we have the Supply Chain Excellence Awards for 2020. Um, every year we find astonishing winners uh, achieving true excellence uh, in the supply chain. Uh, and we anticipate a true celebration of all the accomplishments they've made uh, this year in, of, of all years. Uh, so go to supplychainexcellenceawards.com for more information. Uh, and we'll look forward to welcoming those who are all shortlisted uh, to the London Hilton on Park Lane on the 12th of November. Um, and don't forget that the UK's only materials handling and intro logistics show this year, Intra Logistics, will take place uh, at the Rico Arena in Coventry on the 29th and 30th of September. Um, we're really looking forward to hosting a safe, most importantly, an informative exhibition, uh, giving you the chance to see the very latest materials handling technology. Uh, so go to intralogistics.co.uk to register. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, a copy of a recording of this webinar will be available on logisticsmanager.com from this afternoon uh, so you can catch up on anything you've missed and share it with your colleagues and I'd really encourage you to do that uh, and a full write-up of this webinar will be uh, also appearing on the website and in the July edition of Logistics Manager 
Uh, and finally, that's it. Uh, thank you to everybody for attending. Uh, thank you to our speakers. And we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks time. Thank you.